Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to thoroughly go over everything about physics in game development. Regardless of whether you're a complete beginner who doesn't even know what a force is, or a seasoned game developer who uses physics all the time, I can almost guarantee that you will take something away from this video. This is the ultimate guide for physics in game development. In this video I will use the Unity 3D game engine, but physics is physics, and overall themes will be the same regardless of your engine. The video will be broken up into 8 different sections, where in each section I will go over how a concept works and then do a small demo to show you how you can actually use it. The first section will be on kinematic physics, the next three will be on forces, friction, and drag. After that we'll have two sections on collision and impulsive forces, then a section on rotational kinematics and dynamics. And in the last section I go over everything else about the rigid body component in Unity. If you are a complete beginner I would recommend watching the full video once and save it so you can refer back to it if you forget how something works later on. This is the ultimate guide for physics and game development so you shouldn't need any other tutorial. Quickly before we start, I just want to say that I am very confident with the accuracy of the content in the video, but mistakes happen, so if you guys catch one, put it in the comments, and I'll mention in a pinned comment any mistakes I made. And with all that said, let's get into our first section, kinematics. The first topic in this video is kinematics, so let's first talk about what that fancy word actually means. Google defines it as the branch of mechanics concerned with the motion of objects without reference to forces which cause the motion. This basically means that we are calculating an object's motions from a set of initial conditions. And like Google says, we're not going to consider any forces. So you might be wondering why we don't just jump straight into dealing with forces. And we could, but I think having a solid understanding of kinematics will make the next section significantly easier. When we are working with kinematics, we really only need to know four things, and they are position, velocity, acceleration, and time. Position is an easy one, and it describes where an object is located. The SI unit, or I guess main unit for position, is going to be in meters. Velocity describes how our position changes over time. It's very similar to speed, but there's a slight difference. Its SI unit is meters per second. Acceleration is the hardest to grasp conceptually out of the three, and it describes how velocity changes over time. Because velocity's SI unit is meters per second, and acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time, the unit for acceleration is going to be meters per second squared. And time is just the amount of time elapsed in seconds. All of these three variables are connected with a few equations, but the only one we really need to know is this one. Final position is equal to one half times the acceleration times the change in time squared, plus the initial velocity times the change in time, plus the initial position. We can use this equation for a bunch of different things. Let's use it to predict how far a ball will fall after a certain amount of seconds when dropped off the Empire State Building. The first thing we need to know is our initial conditions. Our initial position is 380 meters, because that's how high the building is. Our initial velocity is going to be 0 meters per second, because we're dropping it. And our acceleration will remain constant or the same for the whole time, because gravity doesn't change. Acceleration due to gravity on Earth is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. In physics, we sometimes refer to this negative 9.8 with a lowercase g, so if you see that later on in the video, that's all it is. Now plug these values into the formula and we get our equation. Oh, and that little triangle next to the t is the Greek letter delta, which means change in. So delta t is just the change in time. So the equation is 1 half times negative 9.8 times delta t squared, plus 0 times delta t, plus 380. We can simplify this a bit by recognizing that half of negative 9.8 is negative 4.9, and that 0 times delta t is just 0, so that whole term can just be removed. Now we can plug in a value for delta t to see how high the ball is after that amount of seconds. For example, after 1 second, the ball is going to be 375.1 meters above the ground. After 7 seconds, the ball is going to be 139.9 meters above the ground, and after 8.8063 seconds, the ball hits the ground. We can figure out that last one by setting the final position to zero and solving for delta t like this. You might think we need to know about the ball's weight or mass in order to determine this information, but we don't. This guy named Galileo threw his balls off the Leaning Tower of Pizza way back when and saw that they both hit the ground at the same time, even though they had different masses. So thanks to Galileo and his balls, we know we don't have to focus on mass when working with kinematics. Just focusing on one dimension, up and down in the case of the previous example, usually isn't all that helpful in game development. A much more likely application of kinematics in game dev is two dimensions, meaning it goes up and down and forwards and backwards. Now before we get into that, we quickly have to talk about a mathematical concept called a vector. A vector is a quantity that has both direction and magnitude. 
Direction is basically just where the vector is pointing, and magnitude is how big the vector is. When you draw vectors, you basically just draw an arrow. Because vectors have both a direction and a magnitude, we can express vectors with two numbers describing its x component and its y component. If we have two components, we can find the magnitude using the Pythagorean theorem, and we can find the direction using the arctangent of y divided by x. If we have the direction and the magnitude, we can also do a bit of trigonometry to find its components. The x component of the vector is just the magnitude times the cosine of the angle, and the y component of the vector is just the magnitude times the sine of the angle. So basically, a vector just tells you the number of units to go across and then the number of units to go up. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense, we're going to be using them a lot during this video, and they'll click when we start applying them. So that's pretty cool, but why do you need to know that? Well, I'm glad you asked, because position, velocity, and acceleration are all vectors, because they all have direction. Time is not a vector, because there's no direction associated with it, and it's referred to as a scalar. This means all three of the vector quantities have an x component completely independent from the y component. So there will be some initial conditions that we're going to have to split up and take everything into consideration for the x components and the y components separately. And then we have to do two separate kinematic equations on each component. Okay, with that long-winded explanation of kinematics, it's time to show you a scenario where this can actually be used. I'm using Unity 3D, but the concepts are the same no matter what game engine you're using. Here I have a scene with a catapult, and attached to the catapult is a script that takes an angle and a power to launch a rock. When I start it and left click, the rock gets launched. This is similar to those Bowmaster ads or something like Angry Birds. In this demo, power is literally just the magnitude of the initial velocity of the rock. If we look at the code behind this, we can see we have a vector 2, which is just a vector with two components, for the rock's initial position and initial velocity. And we have a float, which is a number that can be a decimal, for the time. We also have a bool, which is a true or false variable, to know if the rock has already been launched. So now, let's check out the launch function. The first important thing it does is set the rock's initial position and velocity. And we set this up by specifying the two components. For the velocity, that's the cosine of the angle in radians for the x component, and the sine of the angle in radians for the y component. Then the vector is multiplied by the power, which is the scalar. It then sets the initial position to whatever the position on the rigid body is. This rigid body component is a unity specific thing that means make this object do physics and is really not necessary in this case because on the rigid body we want to mark it as kinematic meaning don't do any forces on this object and let me just control it through a separate script lastly the launch function changes the is launched variable to true the frame the mouse gets clicked the launch function is called so that means the is launch variable is now true and this code right here runs every frame first times increased by the amount of time since the last frame then we find the new x position of the rock and the new y position of the rock then we set the rock's position to a vector 3 with the new x and the new y in their appropriate component. The z component, we just put in the rock's current z position because that doesn't change. Finding the rock's x and y positions is the fun part, because that's when we get to use our kinematic equation. The kinematic equation takes four inputs, acceleration, velocity, position, and time, and it returns the new position we get from doing the kinematic equation. The new rock x is just the kinematic equation with an acceleration of zero, because the rock doesn't speed up or slow down, a velocity of the initial velocity's x component, and a position of the initial position's x component. And for time, we just plug in our time. The new rock y is exactly the same, with the exception of acceleration being negative 9.81 because of gravity, and using the y components for velocity and position. Because this happens every frame, we get a nice smooth launched rock. You might be thinking, wow, this is pretty cool, and I'm definitely going to try to take the kinematic approach when doing stuff like this in the future. And, well, this is pretty good, there are a few drawbacks to using kinematics. The big one is this, no collisions. Or rather, there's no easy way of handling collisions. Also, what happens when you want to launch a heavier rock? You might be thinking, no matter how much the rock weighs, it'll still follow the same trajectory if it's launched with the same initial conditions. Trust in Galileo's balls. And you'd be right, but the catapult wouldn't be able to launch a light rock and a heavy rock with the same initial conditions in the first place. Later on in the video, I'm going to revisit the demo and fix these drawbacks with impulsive forces instead of kinematics. Remember, the main point of this first section of the video is getting us comfortable with position, velocity, and acceleration, and also the concept of a vector, because all of those are here to stay. Next up, we are going to untick the is kinematic checkbox and start using some forces. Forces are a very important part of physics for game developers, because it is pretty much behind everything physics related that you do. Before we start getting into forces, I'm going to quickly discuss the concept of mass. And don't worry, it has nothing to do with church. 
Mass is basically the amount of matter or stuff in an object. Its SI unit is the kilogram, and one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds for all my American friends. So any mass you see, double it, and that's about how heavy it is in the good old US of A. Mass and weight are very similar, but they have some differences. Weight is measured by the force of gravity acting on an object, and mass is constant no matter where you are in the universe. So on Earth, you have the same mass as you do on the moon, but you weigh more on Earth. Mass also has no direction, and it is a scalar quantity, while weight is a force, which is also a vector. Okay, cool. With that quickly specified, let's get into some forces. So long ago, there was this guy named Sir Isaac Newton who made three laws, but we really only care about his second law, which is known as FAMA, or force equals mass times acceleration. Because of this, force has the unit kilograms meters per second squared from the mass and the acceleration. And because this is so commonly used, there's an abbreviation for this unit, which is just N for a Newton of force. So now that we know what a force is, how do we use them when making games? Well, in Unity, you're gonna use the add force function on your rigid body. Other game engines have something similar, so you're just going to have to look up how your specific game engine handles forces. When using the add force function in Unity, you're gonna wanna put it in the fixed update function instead of the regular update function. This is because update can be called a variable amount of times each second, when fixed update gets called in exact intervals defined by a setting in the editor. It's a little confusing, but all you really know is to just use fixed update. When we add a force, we need to specify what force we are adding. Because mass is a scalar and acceleration is a vector, the force is a vector, with a magnitude of the mass times the magnitude of the acceleration. And the direction is just the same as the direction of the acceleration. We are now going to hop into our first quick demo for this section of the video on gravity. Now in Unity and other game engines I assume have gravity built in and it can be activated with a simple check mark. But we're gonna try to use our knowledge of forces and try to understand what's going on behind the scenes when we tick this checkbox. In this scene, I have a little rock with a rigid body attached and use gravity unchecked. I also have another script attached appropriately named gravity. When we open that one up, you can see that not much is going on. We have a field for our rigid body, then an add force inside of the fixed update function. The force that we are adding is the rigid body's mass, which is just rigidbody.mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And if we remember from the previous section of the video, is negative 9.81. And that's only on the y component of the vector 3 because we want it to accelerate down and not forward, backwards, left, or right. And if we head back into Unity and hit play, you can see that our rock falls just like it would with gravity. Now, you might be confused, because you're remembering Galileo's balls and how they fall at the same speed regardless of their mass. But we literally just showed that the higher the mass, the higher the force. Well, because an object with a higher mass takes a greater force to move, and an object with lower mass takes a lower force to move, in the same way as the more massive object, they'll end up falling at the same speed. Think about it this way. The force for a 1 kilogram mass falling is just 9.8 newtons. So using FAMA, we get an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. And if we have a 100 kilogram mass, the force gravity exerts on it is 980 newtons. And again, using FAMA, we get an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. Alright, now let's move on to more applicable examples of forces that you'd be more likely to use throughout your game development journey. In this next demo, I have some spaceships, and I'm going to make them fly forward. The bigger ship has a mass of 50,000 kilograms, and the smaller ship has a mass of 20,000 kilograms. Each ship has gravity ticked off, and a thruster script attached with a field for the rigid body component to be referenced. The thruster script has a constant amount of force the thrusters make, and I set it to 300,000 newtons. In the fixed update function, we add a force in the positive z direction with a magnitude of the force from the thrusters. When I hit play, we can see that the smaller rocket is accelerating faster than the larger rocket. And this makes sense because the mass of the larger rocket is greater than the mass of the smaller rocket. We can calculate their accelerations pretty easy just by dividing the force by their appropriate mass. So the big ship accelerates at a rate of 6 meters per second squared and the smaller ship accelerates at a rate of 15 meters per second squared. Okay, now that you understand how forces work, I quickly want to mention something you should avoid like the plague and that's not changing your mass when attaching a rigid body. Usually when we add rigid bodies, it's just for making things obey gravity. And if you remember Galileo's balls, how mass doesn't affect a falling object, you might just skip assigning a mass. If you consistently do this and you end up needing a force to act on different objects, now they're all gonna respond in the same way. So long story short, always change the mass when you're making a rigid body, unless there is a good reason why it should stay at one kilogram. If you're unsure what the mass should be, literally just look it up online and you'll find a good estimate. Okay, let's move on. Whenever an object exists on Earth, there's a force of gravity being exerted on it, even if it isn't falling. 
This force of gravity is countered by a force called the normal force that pushes back up when you're on the ground. These forces are equal, so the net force acting on you is zero. So let me ask you a question. If a box is on the ramp, what direction would its normal force be in? I'll give you some choices. Is it A, straight up, B, perpendicular to the ramp, C, parallel to the ramp, or D, there is no normal force? And remember, a normal force is the force that counters gravity. It's a tricky question, so don't feel bad if you got it wrong, but the correct answer is B. It points in the direction perpendicular to the slope. It isn't A, because the object will have a force pulling it down the ramp due to gravity, and this has to be accounted for when determining the normal force. It isn't C, because that's the direction the object will move, not the direction that counters gravity. And it isn't D, because there is a contact happening, so we have a normal force. Now just watch what I'm gonna do next. And if you aren't comfortable with geometry and trigonometry, this might be a bit confusing, but just watch. So if I have a box with mass m on a ramp that makes an angle theta with the horizontal, the force of gravity will be directly down with a magnitude of mg. I can take this vector and split it up into two components, one that is parallel to the ramp and the other that is perpendicular to the ramp. These two components must form a right angle with each other. I can redraw my diagram to look something like this now, so I can see that this angle has to be 90 minus theta. So the angle here has to be theta. From here, I can use some trigonometry to figure out that my perpendicular component, which is just the normal force, is mg times the cosine of theta. And my parallel force, or the force at which my object gets pulled down the ramp, is mg times the sine of theta. This takes us to our next demo, a car breaking down a ramp. Now, there are two ways of approaching this problem. There's the physics way and the cheeky game developer way. For the physics way, which I'm going to start with, we apply a force with a magnitude of the braking force in the direction of the back of the car until the car reaches a speed of zero. Then we want to set the applied force equal to the force gravity is doing to the car. In code, I kind of just threw both methods into one script, so bear with my confusing code for a minute. The script is attached to the car game object with a rigid body component of a mass of 1,000 kilograms. The is using equilibrium force when braking boolean is true here, and that basically means we're doing the physics method. All the other variables should be pretty self-explanatory. In the update function, we're setting the is braking boolean to whether left click is held down. So if left click is being held down, we're braking. And that if statement doesn't concern us at the moment. In fixed update, we check if the car is stopped and if we are braking, and also if the car isn't stopped and we are not braking. Here is the is car stopped function if you quickly wanted to see how this works. But anyways, if the car is not stopped and we are braking, we're going to call the brake function with the brake force magnitude passing as the argument. The brake function just adds a force with the magnitude of the brake force magnitude parameter in the direction of the rear of the car. I use transform.right and not transform.forward because I messed up when importing things from Blender and had to rotate. Now for braking and we're already stopped, the brake force will literally pull the car back up the ramp. So instead, we need to apply a force exactly equal to the force of gravity, but just in the opposite direction. So I pass in the equilibrium force magnitude at an angle of the car's rotation to perfectly stop the car. The get equilibrium force magnitude is just a function that uses that mg times the sine of theta expression we found earlier. Now, even though the car shouldn't move, it does move a tiny amount. And I think that's just the way Unity orders its physics calculations, but I honestly have no idea but we can do the cheeky game developer way to get around this. In the update function, if the car is stopped, we can set its gravity to false and take note of its position. In the fixed update, instead of using the is using equilibrium force, we can just set the position equal to the stop position. Here, we can see that the car comes to a complete stop and gets moving again when it stops braking. Using a forces approach to physics and game development is usually a lot better than kinematics because we can take heavier objects into consideration but it does not end there. The next two sections are applications of what we just learned to make things act even more realistically. And we're gonna start with friction. What is friction? Well, it's the force that resists the motion of two objects in contact. All that means is when you slide something, it will eventually stop because friction is acting on it. Now, how do we figure out what friction force gets applied to our objects? We just use this simple formula. The force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction represented with the Greek letter mu, times the force normal, which if you remember from the last section, is the force that counters gravity. Okay, this doesn't seem too crazy. The only thing we really need to know about is this guy, the coefficient of friction. And the best part about it is that we really don't have to calculate it. It's usually a value we just come up with ourselves. Nine out of 10 times, this is gonna be a value from zero, a frictionless surface, 
to 1, a very rough surface. It can be greater than 1, but it's pretty uncommon in real life. Here's a really quick example. So say we have a 10 kilogram object being pulled with a force of 30 newtons on a surface where the coefficient of friction is 0.2, and we want to figure out the net force on this object. The net force is just the resulting force of all of the forces acting on the objects. And here we only have two unbalanced forces, the 30 newton pull and the force of friction. To find the force of friction, we just take the normal force, which is 9.8 times 10, which is just 98, and multiply it by our coefficient of friction of 0.2 to get 19.6 newtons. Because the forces are in opposite directions, we subtract 30 minus 9.6 to get our net force of 10.4 newtons. And all of a sudden, if we stop pulling this object, we will have a net force of negative 9.6 newtons slowing it down until it stops. There are two types of friction, static friction and kinetic friction. If an object is at rest, we use static friction. And if it's in motion, we use kinetic friction. In the previous example, it was kinetic friction. Static friction should always be greater than or equal to kinetic friction on a surface that doesn't change. And there shouldn't be a huge difference between them either. So, all that is pretty cool, but how do we actually use this in Unity? Well, the very first thing you should do is change this setting in the physics section of your project called friction type to two-dimensional friction type so friction works properly or at least change it off of patch friction if you're looking for accurate results. The next thing you do is make a physics material where you can enter a static friction and a dynamic friction. Dynamic friction is just another name for kinetic friction, by the way. The friction value you set isn't necessarily going to be your coefficient of friction. Instead, what happens is the friction value of one object gets combined somehow with the friction value of the other object to get a coefficient of friction used in the calculation. These combination types are maximum, minimum, average, and multiply. These names are pretty self-explanatory on how the coefficient of friction is obtained. You usually should just stick with average unless there's a scenario where you need a frictionless surface, then you set friction to zero and a combined type to minimum. If two objects have different combined types, the type that ends up being used is maximum, if any are maximum, multiply, if any are multiply, minimum, if there's any minimums, and then finally average. The default physics material is 0.6 for both frictions, and the combined type is set for average, and this is important. If an object doesn't have any physics material, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have friction. It secretly has this default physics material behavior. That's why I had to have physics materials set to frictionless surfaces sometimes in the previous sections, if you didn't realize. Okay, let's get on to our friction demo. Here we have four boxes with a rigid body attached with a mass of five kilograms. They also have a script attached that applies the same force of 25 newtons in the same direction when I hold down left click. In addition to that, the boxes each have the same physics material applied to them, with a static friction of 0.3 and a dynamic friction of 0.25, with a friction combined of average. The only difference between the four boxes is the surface they slide on. The green surface has a static friction and a dynamic friction of zero, with a combined type of minimum, meaning the surface is frictionless. The yellow surface has a static and dynamic friction of 0.1, with average for combined type. The orange surface has a static and dynamic friction of 0.5, with combined set to average, and finally, the red surface has a static friction of 0.74 and a dynamic friction of zero. Try to predict what's gonna happen with these boxes. In particular, what's gonna happen to the green one when I stop applying the force, and what will the red one do? If you want to, write your predictions down in the comments along with the last two letters of your third favorite color. And they're off. When I stop applying the force, the green one flies off the surface at a constant velocity. So if you said something like that, give yourself a gold star. The yellow one slows down and stops, and it doesn't look like much has happened with the orange or red boxes. When I reapply the force, we can see that the orange box is actually moving, just really slowly. And when I stop applying the force again, it quickly returns to rest. And for the red box, even though it has no dynamic friction, the static friction is just a little too high to cause it to initially move for the dynamic friction to kick in. Because both friction types are average, the coefficient of static friction on the red surface is 0.52. So using the friction formula, we can see that the box needs to have an applied force greater than 25.48 newtons in order for it to start moving. And our applied force is 25 newtons as a reminder. Quick side note, the red surface is for demonstration only. And if you want a really rough surface, don't have a dynamic friction of zero. Cool. Now that we have that done, let's see what happens with friction on ramps. As we saw in the previous section, the force exerted on an object on a ramp at an angle theta due to gravity is mg times the sine of theta. But we also proved that in the same section that the normal force is mg times the cosine of theta, but we didn't do anything with it. 
Now that we have our friction equation, which has the normal force in it, we can use this to calculate the net force. The magnitude of our force of friction ends up being mu mg times the cosine of theta. So our net force is mg times the sine of theta minus mu times mg times the cosine of theta. And think about it. Nothing is being taken away from the mg sine theta expression from earlier, because with this new one, if mu is zero, just like everything in the last section, it all simplifies down to mg times the sine of theta. Another cool thing we can do is see what the coefficient of friction is needed in order to make a box not slide down a ramp. For that to happen, our force of friction must be greater than or equal to the applied force. So the coefficient of static friction times mg cosine theta must be greater than or equal to mg sine theta. So if we divide both sides by mg cosine theta, the mg's cancel out, and the sine theta over cosine theta simplifies down to tangent of theta. So the coefficient of static friction must be greater than the tangent of the angle of the ramp in order to make the box move. And because the mg's cancel out, this works for any mass, and it works for any different gravity amount too. This is exactly what our next demo shows. As you can see, we have a box of 5 kilograms on a ramp with an angle of 30 degrees. The tangent of 30 is 0.577, so in order for the box not to slide, mu must be greater than 0.577. The box and the ramp have the same physics material, so in this case, mu is just the friction value, because the average of two of the same numbers is just the number. I made a quick script that changes the coefficient of friction to the inputted value, and as you can see, our mu is 0.57. So take a second and think of what's going to happen. Because 0.57 is less than 0.577, I'm guessing this box is going to really slowly slide down the ramp. And when we hit play, we can see that I'm right. If we change the mu to say 0.58 and hit play, we can see that the box moves a tiny bit due to the force that the half centimeter fall that it takes onto the ramp does, but it quickly comes to the rest due to the kinetic friction. So in conclusion, just like you should always set a mass when making a rigid body, you should also pick values for the friction so your object will come to rest when no unbalanced forces are exerted onto it. If you don't know what values to use for your friction, you can just look up a coefficient of friction of steel or whatever material the surface is. And honestly, you can just put a high friction if your surface is rough and a low friction if your surface is smooth. Your players definitely will not be able to tell the difference. In the next section, we're going to look at another resistive force called drag. So we just learned about friction, the force that resists motion when two surfaces are in contact. But what about when an object is falling in freefall and there's nothing touching it? Is there still any sort of resistive force acting on it? And the answer is yes, only if you're on Earth though. If you're in space with no atmosphere, the answer is no. We call the force that resists the motion of an object in freefall air resistance or drag. The equation for drag is the force of drag is equal to 1 half times rho, the density of the fluid, times the velocity squared, times the coefficient of drag, times the cross-sectional area. This is uh, kind of a lot, and we really can make this a lot simpler and have it work in the same way conceptually while not really being 100% physically accurate. We can say that the force is equal to negative b times an object's velocity. With this new equation, we get the same idea of having a higher drag with a higher velocity, but the b kind of dumbs everything down with the density and the cross-sectional area into a big b, big drag. So as you can see, with this equation, the force of drag is directly proportional to its velocity, which means that the drag force will increase as an object is in the air. The other force acting on an object is gravity, which is constant. And because drag is a force that resists motion, it can't be greater than the force of gravity. So this means that the drag force will approach the force of gravity. Because of that, the object's velocity will approach a single value it will not pass, unless something else happens to the object. This velocity is called the object's terminal velocity. We can more rigorously define terminal velocity as the constant velocity that a freely falling object approaches as the resistance of the medium through which it's falling approaches the acceleration caused by gravity. Here's how we can calculate an object's terminal velocity. If we have a 5 kilogram object falling through a medium with a b of 0.08, and we're looking for its terminal velocity, first we have to recognize that a constant velocity, which is what terminal velocity is, occurs when no net forces are acting on the object, or the sum of all of its forces is zero. This means that the force of gravity plus the force of drag equals zero. So mg minus bv equals zero. And if we plug in our values and solve for v, we get a terminal velocity of 612.5 meters per second. 
If we have exactly the same conditions, but with a 10 kilogram mass, we can see that our terminal velocity is going to be 1,225 meters per second, which just so happens to be twice the terminal velocity of the 5 kilogram mass. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If these objects are exactly the same, besides from their masses, how did Galileo's experiment with his balls show that objects accelerate at the same speed when falling? Well, because the fall probably wasn't big enough for the objects to get anywhere near their terminal velocities. But that's just what I think, and maybe I'm wrong. He is absolutely right about this, if he was in a vacuum, because on the Apollo 15 mission, astronaut David Scott dropped a hammer and a feather at the same time on the moon, and showed that they both hit the ground at the same time. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? I'll have the full video linked below in the description. So, all this drag stuff is great, but how does it affect us game developers? Well, it just so happens that we can incorporate the ideas of air resistance into our game physics. In your game engine, we can do this by changing the drag or air resistance, or any sort of synonym of that. In Unity, it's the drag section of the rigid body component. Now, a sane person would assume that the drag value would just be B, but unfortunately, it's not. In Unity, drag is B divided by the mass. So in order to incorporate the examples from earlier in Unity, we can't just set drag to be 0.08, because that would be crazy talk. Instead, we're going to have to take the extra step of dividing it by the mass, so the drag variable for the 5 kilogram object would be 0.08 divided by 5, which would be 0.016, and the drag variable for the 10 kilogram object would be 0.008. When picking a value for B, you could do a bit of calculations by having a target terminal velocity in mind, but honestly, picking values that just seem good is totally fine too. Just like friction, it can be done accurately, but we can also just pick values that give a similar effect. Now let's get into the demo for terminal velocity. In this scene, I have an 80 kilogram skydiver who has just jumped out of a plane that is one kilometer high and is falling into the ocean. The terminal velocity of humans is about 55 meters per second, and we can use this to get a value for B, and then we can just find the value for the drag. Just set up the equation mg minus bv equals zero, and plug in our values to get 9.81 times 80 minus 55b equals zero, and then solve for b to get b equals 14.27. Then we want to find out what the unity drag variable is, so we just take our b and divide it by our mass, so 14.27 divided by 80 is 0.1784. Our poor skydiver will hit the water and, you know, die. So I think we should give him a parachute to open when I press left click. And this parachute will make the drag 10 times what it previously was, which will result in the skydiver slowing down until he floats calmly down to the water. In this demo, going in the water will also increase the drag to simulate the skydiver slowly sinking. Realistically, we would do something else in the water with a buoyancy force, but this can be a little research homework assignment for you if you want, because I think that's a little too specific to put inside this video. Anyways, let's get ready to jump. So, that was drag. And remember, you don't have to be crazy accurate with this one, just make sure it isn't noticeably a lot. And most of the time, it's not even noticeable when there isn't any. That's going to conclude our little look at regular forces. And now we're going to take a look at what happens when forces happen instantly, like in collisions. In this section of the video, we're going to talk about collisions. You might be thinking, Will, Unity handles all the collisions for me, so why do I need to learn about them? Well, there are a few different types of collisions to talk about, and they also teach us about an important concept called momentum, which we're going to need to understand before moving on to the arguably more important next section. So what is this momentum that I speak of? All it is is mass times velocity. So P, the variable for momentum, equals mv. It's pretty straightforward. Super quick example. If I have a 10 kilogram box moving at 5 meters per second, what's its momentum? Well, P equals mv, so P equals 10 times 5, so P equals 50 kilograms meters per second. Cool. Now that we have an understanding on what momentum is, I'm going to tell you why it's actually useful. Momentum is always conserved. 
Here's a quick real life demo of what I mean. And don't try this at home. As you can see, I am standing on my chair that rolls and I'm gonna jump off. Both my momentum and the chair's momentum right now are zero because neither of us are moving. And when I jump off, both of our momentum should be the same, just in the opposite directions. Because the chair is a lot less massive than I am, the chair obtained a higher velocity. The law of conservation of momentum is the backbone of how collisions work. When two objects collide, their momentum before the collision equals their momentum after the collision. So if two objects are each 5 kilograms and are traveling head-on with a speed of 10 meters per second, how fast are they traveling after they collide? Do they completely stop? Do they have a tiny bit of speed left over in the opposite direction they started traveling? Or do they travel 10 meters per second in the opposite direction? This is kind of a trick question because all of these are possible outcomes. Think about it. The change in momentum from the first object always equals the change of momentum from the second object. So the momentum is conserved. In order to determine what happens to the objects, we need to determine the elasticity of the collision. There are three main types of collisions. Elastic collisions, where no energy is lost. Inelastic collisions, where some energy is lost and perfectly inelastic collisions where all energy is lost. I could more rigorously define what energy is in this case, but all we really need to know is that the energy I'm talking about is kinetic energy, which is based on velocity. So associate velocity in this case with energy. So let's take a closer look at the collision types. First, we'll talk about perfectly inelastic collisions. That collision describes the first scenario from earlier, where both objects come to a stop. In perfectly inelastic collisions, two objects often act like one bigger, more massive object after the collision. For example, if one of the 5 kilogram boxes is stationary from earlier, the result becomes two masses sliding together at 5 meters per second. Think of a car crash as this type of collision, because the two objects often interlock after they collide. The third scenario from earlier describes an elastic collision, and in this one, two objects perfectly bounce off of each other. If we look at the example we used for the perfectly inelastic collision, where one of the masses was stationary, an elastic collision will result in the mass on the left stopping, and the mass on the right obtaining a velocity equal to the velocity that hit it. So the left object stops, while the right object moves at a velocity of 10 meters per second. Think of billiard balls colliding as an elastic collision. Now the second scenario from earlier describes an inelastic collision, and there can literally be an infinite number of these. If we go back to the stationary example, the object on the left will have a slower speed than before, and the object on the right will have a speed, but one that is less than the original speed of the object on the left. Think of a bouncy ball getting lower and lower with each bounce as this kind of a collision. There are most likely ways of adjusting the elasticity of collisions in your game engine, but in Unity, all we have to do is go back to our physics materials. If you remember from earlier, this is where we made our objects have friction. Now we're going to adjust the bounciness setting, where 0 is a perfectly inelastic collision, and 1 is an elastic collision. Anything in between is an inelastic collision. And the higher the number, the more elastic the collision will be. The bounciness combined works exactly like the friction combined, so rewatch that part of the video if you forget. Now for our first demo. In this scene, I have seven 10 kilogram balls. Each ball has a different color with a different physics material attached to it. The ground has a physics material with a bounciness of zero and the bounce combined set to maximum. So the collision will always have a bounciness of whatever the bounciness of the ball is. I set the ball so that the dark red ball is perfectly inelastic and the dark green ball is an elastic collision. While all the balls in between are elastic, with the greener balls being more elastic than inelastic, and the redder balls being more inelastic than elastic. If I were to ask you what bounciness the dark green ball would have, you probably would say 1, because it's an elastic collision. But it doesn't. And I don't know why, but when there's a bounciness of 1, a tiny amount of energy is added, meaning the ball bounces slightly higher each time, which is not physically accurate. So I set it to a value of 0.977 instead. In the next demo, I have two columns with three rows of boxes on a frictionless surface. The boxes on the top row are perfectly inelastic. The boxes in the middle are elastic with a bounciness of 0.5, and the boxes on the bottom are elastic with a bounciness of 1. I have a script called Initial Velocity Setter attached to an empty game object. This script has three lists of rigid bodies. One for the perfectly inelastic boxes, another for the inelastic boxes, and finally for the elastic boxes. I set it up in the inspector, where the box on the left is referred to as box 1, and has an index of 0 in its appropriate list, and the box on the right, referred to as box 2, has an index of 1 in the list. I also have two fields that control the velocity of the boxes, and two fields that control the masses of the boxes. The start function just sets all of the box 1 velocities and all the box 2 velocities, then all the box 1 masses, and then finally, the box 2 masses. 
So if I set the velocities to 1 and negative 1, so they're going to collide at a head-on collision at the same speed, and I set their masses to 1, predict what's going to happen to each box. Well, that's probably not what you predicted, and that's because there's a secret setting that I haven't told you about. In Edit, Project Settings, and then Physics, there is a Bounce Threshold setting set to 2. This means if a collision has a velocity of 2 or lower, it will always behave like a perfectly inelastic collision. Let's crank this down to something like 0.1 and try again. That's probably more along the lines of what you predicted. With this little script, we can set up interesting situations to see how the different collision types affect the outcome. Like this one. Box 1 has a velocity of 5 and a mass of 10. Box 2 has a velocity of 1 and a mass of 2. Now, let's see what happens when we change the mass of box 2 to 50. Hmm, very interesting. So as you can see, collisions can be very different based on the type of collision and the masses and velocities of the object. This is all the more reason why you should set an accurate mass as the first thing you do when you make a physics object for a game. And now, when picking a value for your friction, you should also consider the bounciness value for your object as well. Now we're going to take our new understanding of momentum and talk about something pretty paradoxical, an instantaneous force. Earlier, we learned about forces and how they accelerate an object when it is constantly applied. But what happens if a force is applied at an instant? That's what we're going to be covering in this section of the video. But first, we quickly have to discuss what an impulse is. An impulse, denoted with the variable j, is a force times a time. j also equals delta p, or the change in momentum. And let's take a second to understand what's going on here. If I have a 1 kilogram object and it's at rest, and a 1 newton force acts on it for 1 second, after the 1 second, the object will be moving at a speed of 1 meter per second. So our impulse here would be 1 newton times 1 second, so 1 newton second. Because j equals delta p, which equals final p minus initial p, we can see that if we look at an impulse in the eyes of a change in momentum, we have 1 times 1 minus 1 times 0, which is just 1 kilogram meters per second, as the impulse, which equals 1 newton second if you just cancel out the units. Let's see what happens if the impulse remains the same, but we act it over a longer time. Because j equals ft and j equals 1, ft equals 1. This is what's called an inverse proportion, where when one variable decreases, the other increases. So if our time is 0.5 seconds and our impulse is 1, the force required is 2 newtons. If our time is 0.1 second and our impulse is 1, the force required is 10 newtons. See where this is going? Now let's plug 0 in for t to see how much force we need at an instant. So we have 0 times the force equals 1, and 0 times anything is 0, so we have 0 equals 1. Huh? If we graph this inverse proportion and see that at time equals 0, we're undefined. But we can also see that our force blasts off towards infinity as time approaches zero from the right. So what force do we need to make this work? And you know what? That's a great question. Do you see how paradoxical this whole idea of a force at an instant is now? Okay then, if there's no such thing as an instantaneous force, then how do guns work? And how do collisions happen? Well, the answer is simple. T is just a really small positive value. We call these forces that act over a short time an impulsive force. We can realistically add these impulsive forces by first figuring out what the change in momentum should be to get our impulse, then defining some small value for t and determining how much force will be needed to satisfy everything. Then just set a little timer and count down from t until it gets to zero and constantly add the force over that interval. For example, if I want a 10 kilogram object at rest to achieve a velocity of 100 meters per second, my impulse would be final momentum minus initial momentum, so 100 times 10 minus 0 times 10, or 1000 kilogram meters per second. Next, I want to think about how fast this should happen. Let's say 0.01 seconds. So now I set up my j equals ft equation and plug in my variables. So 1000 equals 0.01f, Divide both sides by 0.01 to get a required force of 100,000 newtons. After that, I will simply have to code in 100,000 newtons of force constantly being added to the object for 0.01 seconds and then stop applying the force. Now you're probably thinking, Will, that's a lot of work to simulate something that people will only really notice the speed change. So should I still do this the realistic way? Absolutely not. We're making games here. We're not making NASA rocket simulations. So if we can change the velocity at an instant to get the same effect with a much easier method, we'll do it. 
In Unity, this is so common, it has a special way of doing this built into the add force function. This is done by writing force mode dot impulse as the second argument in the function. Now the force is passed in as the first argument will be an impulse, which will change the momentum instantly by changing its velocity. The formula that Unity uses here is final velocity equals the initial velocity plus the impulse divided by the object's mass. Okay, awesome. Remember how I said at the start of the video with the catapult demo, how there was a much better way of doing Doing things instead of kinematically, well, now we're going to see how that method works. In this scene, we have three identical catapults, each carrying a different sized rock. They also all have the same script attached to them, called Catapult Launch Impulsive Force. This script has three fields shown in the inspector, where we put the rigid body of the rock being launched and adjust the angle and power. In the update function, all we need to do is check to see whether we click the mouse and if we're not yet in the air. And if so, call the launch function. The launch function first sets the in-air boolean to true, so we won't accidentally add more than one force if we accidentally click twice. It also sets the rock's rigid body's kinematic state to false. It's true in the first place because of something I had to do with the visual event. After that, I invoke the visual event, which is purely visual, so I won't waste time explaining it. Now we add the force. Just like in the kinematic catapult demo, I need to first find the launch direction. So I did the same thing to get a normalized vector pointing in the right direction. From there, I multiply the direction vector by the power, which is the scalar, to get my vector for the impulse. I then set force mode to force mode.impulse, and that's everything. Now back in Unity, my catapults are all firing with 100 newtons of force, set at a 45 degree angle. The small rock is 5 kilograms, the medium rock is 10 kilograms, and the big rock is 15 kilograms. I also gave them a little bit of drag and some friction. If I hit play, I can left click and watch my rocks fly. Doing it this way, we can use everything we already learned about, like friction, drag, and proper collisions, while having rocks from different masses launched at different velocities. Another benefit is how much less code is required. The only advantage kinematics has on us is the fact that we could trace out a trajectory and show the user, where if we're using this method, it makes it a lot more difficult. This is going to wrap up our discussion on actual motion, and now we're going to get into some rotations. So we just went over a bunch of stuff about moving things around, but now we're gonna talk about rotating them. And just like how we started the video with kinematics, we're gonna start this section with rotational kinematics. And the two are very similar. The first thing I'm gonna do is introduce us to three new variables, theta, omega, and alpha. Theta is basically just the angle, or how rotated an object is. Theta is measured in degrees or radians. If you have never used a radian before, they're just a different way of expressing an angle, where the angle is a fraction of pi, where pi is just 180 degrees. So a 90 degree angle in radians is pi divided by 2, and a 45 degree angle is pi over 4, and so on. Omega describes how theta changes over time, and it's measured in radians per second or degrees per second. Omega is also referred to as angular velocity. Lastly, alpha describes how omega changes over time. It makes our angle speed up or slow down. It's measured in degrees or radians per second squared, and it's referred to as angular acceleration. Hmm, these seem awfully familiar to position, velocity, and acceleration, and that's because they're literally the exact same and now with an angle and not a position. Because of this connection to regular kinematics, we can replace the variables in the main kinematic equation from earlier and get something that works for angular kinematics. Let's start with the xf equals 1 half a delta t squared plus v delta t plus xi kinematic equation and substitute our angular versions for the variables. So x becomes theta, v becomes omega, and a becomes alpha. So our angular kinematic equation is theta f equals 1 half alpha delta t squared plus omega delta t plus theta i. We aren't going to waste any longer talking about this because we literally did this at the start of the video, but just with regular motion. So let's hop into our first demo. In this scene, I have a car's wheel with a rigid body attached with is kinematic ticked. I also have a script called wheelspin also attached. This script has four fields visible in the inspector that lets us change our initial angle, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. There's also a boolean variable to see if the inputted values are in radians or not. I also have two other variables, one for the rigid body, which I assign in the start function with get component, and another for time. The angular kinematic equation function does that exact equation we talked about earlier and returns what theta f is. In the update function, we get the angle for the current frame. Then we set the tire's rotation equal to this right here. So this quaternion thing means that we're dealing with rotations and the dot Euler means we're working in Euler angles. This means we say how rotated we are in the x-axis, then the y-axis, and then the z-axis. The only reason we have 180 degrees in the y-axis is because I messed up importing from Blender. 
The last part basically says if we're in radians, convert them to degrees, and if we aren't in radians, just leave the angle as is. Lastly, we increase the time. When everything is set up in the inspector and hit play, we can see that our car tire is rotating. Okay, awesome. If you crank up the speed sufficiently high enough, you'll see that our tire will start to jitter, and it might even look like it's going backwards. I don't want to spend a crazy amount of time talking about this, because it's not very important, but if you want to do some research on it, it's pretty cool. I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the computer's frame rate. Cool. Now let's move on to a non-kinematic topic called torque. Now torque is a pretty easy concept to understand, but it gets more confusing when you try to see how a torque affects an object's rotation. So we're going to start with the easier part. So what is torque? Torque is just a measure of a force that causes an object to spin around an axis. Torque is represented with the Greek letter tau, and it is a vector quantity equal to the distance from the place it twists at to the point where the force is applied represented with r, times the force that is applied. This may have been a little bit confusing, but it's not that bad. If I have a seesaw, 10 meters long, and I have the fulcrum thingy in the center, and apply 100 newtons of force at one end of the seesaw, the torque is just the distance to the point where the force is, which is 5 meters, times the force, which is 100 newtons. So the torque is 500 newton meters. If our force is applied at an angle, then we want to find the perpendicular component of our force and multiply that instead. So our equation becomes tau equals rf sine theta, where theta is the angle between the force and r. Most of the time in game dev, your theta will just be 90 degrees, so that sine of 90 degrees is 1, so you don't really have to worry about it. Now if this fulcrum gets moved 3 meters to the right, our r is now 8, so our torque is 800 newton meters. This also means that our torque on the other side must also be 800 newton meters. We know our r on the other side is 2 meters, so we can now say 800 equals 2f to get a force of 400 newtons coming off the other side. Fun fact, this is why levers are such an effective simple machine. In Unity, and most likely in other game engines, we can add forces to specific points on our objects to create torques. Remember, we haven't quite learned how these torques rotate the objects around their axes, but before that, I'm going to do a quick demo of the earlier concept. So in this scene, I have an invisible gun, and there's a bad guy in front of me. He has a rigid body attached with a 75 kilogram mass. He's also made out of capsule colliders. Attached to the camera, I have a script called Shoot Gun. It has a field for the magnitude of the force, and also a bool to check whether we're aiming. I'll explain that one in a minute. In the update function, I check for when the player clicks with the mouse, and when they do, I first get the vector in the direction of where the camera is to where the mouse was clicked, and then I use that direction in a ray starting at the camera's position. From there, I ray cast 10 meters in the direction of the ray. And if I hit anything, I'll check to see if it has a rigid body. If it did end up hitting something with a rigid body, I'll add a force to the rigid body at a point using the add force at position function, with the first argument being the force and the second argument being the position, and the last argument being force mode. So this is where the is aiming variable comes in. The player can either shoot from where he is, the is aiming variable true, or the player can shoot directly in front of where the hit point is. The first will have an angle in it, and the second will just be straight up perpendicular to the point. So to put this in code, I first got the direction, either the normalized direction of the ray, or the vector straight ahead. Then I scaled it with the gun force. The second argument was the point where the ray has hit the collider. And the last argument is force mode.impulse, because this is a one-time instant hit, not a constant force. Phew. That was a lot, and probably a bit confusing if you don't know what ray casting is, but let's just shoot this bad guy for a bit. Okay, cool. Now it's time for the more confusing part, how torque affects the rotation of an object. So remember from Ma, force equals mass times acceleration from earlier? Well, we're going to use something similar here, where our torque is going to equal the angular acceleration times inertia. So what is inertia? Well, it's the inertia tensor's component value for the same axis you're rotating around. So what's the inertia tensor? Well, maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but on a rigid body component, there's a section called the inertia tensor and it describes how mass gets distributed around the object. And I do not know how this calculation works, and frankly, I don't want to. I'm just glad Unity does it for us. So if we are rotating a 10 kilogram cube around the x-axis, its inertia will be 1.67 kilograms meters squared. 
So, if a constant torque of 10 newton meters is applied to this 5 kilogram rectangular prism, let's find its angular acceleration. So our torque equals our inertia times our angular acceleration, so 10 equals our angular acceleration times 10.833. And we got that 10.833 value from the inertia tensor. So, alpha is going to equal 0.923 radians per second squared. So we can make objects rotate by using the add torque function in unity, which will simply give an angular acceleration around a specific axis by dividing the magnitude of the torque by the inertia from the inertia tensor. Oh, and a positive torque will rotate an object counterclockwise, and a negative torque will rotate an object clockwise. We can make an instant torque by setting force mode to impulse, and it will work exactly the same as instant forces from earlier, except we're dividing our impulse by our inertia and adding it to our initial angular velocity, instead of dividing it by mass and adding regular velocity. Okay, awesome. I know this last section with torque and inertia can be a little bit confusing, so great job sticking with it. I'm now going to do one last demo for rotational dynamics about spinning objects. In this demo scene, I have five different boxes. The two on the left both have a mass of one kilogram, and the only difference between them is that the one on the right is longer. The middle box is five kilograms, and the box to its right has a mass of 10 kilograms. Finally, the mass of the large box on the far right is 10 kilograms. Next, I have an empty game object with a script attached, which is responsible for giving all objects the same torques. Here, we have a list of the rigid bodies, and in the spin function, we loop through this list and add the same torque to all of them. We add an impulsive torque if the right mouse button is clicked, and a constant torque when the left mouse button is held. Now make your predictions about what's going to happen to our boxes, and I'm going to start by simply adding an impulsive torque of 1 to all of them. As you can see, the boxes are arranged in a way where the fastest spinning objects, aka the objects with the lowest moment of inertia, are on the left, and the objects with the most inertia are on the right. Hopefully seeing the effect that mass and the object shape have on the object's rotational velocities was helpful. That's going to conclude all of the main physics in this video. And the last section is pretty much going to be everything else about rigid bodies in Unity. If you're using a different game engine, you probably will still find some value in it, so I wouldn't go anywhere. In this last section of the video, we're going to go over pretty much everything else about the rigid body component in Unity that we have yet to already talk about. First is the collision detection mode. If an object is moving slowly, has a mesh collider, or you simply just want better performance, use discrete collision detection. Otherwise, you want to use a continuous one. Use continuous dynamic for objects that are going to be moving fast. Use plain old continuous for objects that aren't going to be moving per se, but will be getting collided into and use continuous speculative if you want a cheaper continuous collision detection mode. Next up is the rigid body constraints. These ones are pretty straightforward. If an object has a constraint along an axis, whether that be freeze position or freeze rotation, the object will not be allowed to move or rotate respectively along the checked axis when a force acts on the object. Note that the objects can still be moved and rotated kinematically with these constraints ticked. If you specifically want an object not to rotate at all, set the rigid body's freeze rotation boolean to true. Next, I want to mention the on trigger and on collision functions, even though they're not technically something that has to deal specifically with rigid bodies. When giving an object a collider, you can mark this collider as a trigger, and this makes it ignore all collisions and instead just calls the trigger functions. The on trigger enter function gets called when something enters the trigger, the on trigger stay function gets called each physics tick an object is in a trigger, and the on trigger exit function gets called when a collider exits the trigger. The on collision enter stay and exit function work exactly the same, but just with talking about if the objects are in contact. Now I want to talk to you about the center of mass, and I'm not going to get into exactly what the center of mass is, so if you don't know and are curious, just look it up. But in Unity, we can change where our center of mass is if our object doesn't have a uniform distribution of mass. We can do this with rigid body's center of mass variable and assign it a new vector 3. This center of mass will be local to the object, not global. If you want to revert back to the object's original center of mass, just call the reset center of mass function on the rigid body. Next up is the set density function. Density is a scalar equal to mass divided by volume, and when you call the set density function on a rigid body, you pass in a density as the argument. From there, Unity will calculate the volume and divide the density by the volume and set the object's mass equal to the result. This is a more niche function, but it will probably be useful for having an object whose shape may vary. The next rigid body function we're going to talk about is the add explosion force function. This function has a single point acting as the explosion point, 
then it figures out what point on the rigid body's collider is closest to that point, then it gets the direction from where that point is to the explosion point, and adds a force in that direction. With that said, there are five parameters for this function. The first is the explosion force, which is a float acting as the magnitude of the explosion force. This magnitude is proportional to the distance from the explosion point, so objects farther away get a smaller force exerted on them. The next one, explosion position, is a vector 3, which is about a point in world space where the explosion is coming from. The next parameter, explosion radius, is a float responsible for the radius that affects the rigid body. So if the object is in the sphere created by the radius, it will have a force exerted on it. Next is a completely visual effect called upwards modifier, which gives the object a small upward force to send them flying into the air too. This one is not physically accurate and is purely for dramatic effect. Lastly is the force mode, and this one should pretty much always be set to force mode.impulse because explosions are pretty much always impulsive forces. Once you set these parameters to your liking, you can simulate an explosion. The next rigid body function I want to talk about is the add relative force and torque functions. These do exactly the same as their normal counterparts we talked about earlier, except they act locally not globally. What I mean by this is that an object rotated 180 degrees on the x-axis will behave the same way if a relative force in the up direction acts on it as it would if a regular force in the down direction acts on it. Now I want to talk to you about this interpolation thing you see right here. Most of the time you want it off, but in the case of the main camera following a rigid body around, you might want to change this if things start looking jittery. This happens because physics updates with a fixed tick while the graphics updates as many times as it can. If you set this to interpolate, the movement should look a lot smoother, but it may lag behind due to interpolation from the previous frame and the current frame. If this is a bigger problem, switch to extrapolate, which will predict where the object will be in the future and render it there. Extrapolate generally has more problems though, so first try interpolate. Now, there's kind of a big part of the main rigid body component that I have yet to discuss, and that's angular drag. I understand what this does conceptually, it slows a rotating object's rotation down, where higher numbers mean a bigger slowdown, for lack of a better word. And I honestly have no clue what the math behind this angular drag variable is, and how it affects the angular velocity. So that's why I really haven't mentioned it earlier. You should have some angular drag on your rigid bodies though, so they can eventually come to a stop when spinning. And a quick side note, this angular drag will also yield an angular terminal velocity, which is pretty cool too. The next two things are going to be very niche, and I can't really think of a scenario where you'd actually need them, but you can figure out the tangential velocity of a rotating object by using the get point velocity function and passing in a vector 3 in world space as the point for the first argument. The next function is called closest point on bounds, which also takes a vector 3 for the point you want to find the closest point on the rigid body's collider. This function returns a vector 3 for the closest point. Now, there is one more big topic with rigid bodies that I haven't really covered yet, and that's rigid body sleeping. I think it's a little bit confusing and out of the scope of this tutorial, so I'm not really going to mention it right now. But if you're noticing that your physics objects sometimes just aren't interacting stuff, you might want to look into this because they might just be asleep. Let's take a few minutes to recap everything we learned today. First, we talked about what position, velocity, and acceleration are, and how they relate to each other with time. We also got this fancy formula for finding the position of an object at a certain time given an initial position, velocity, and acceleration. It's xf equals 0.5a delta t squared plus v delta t plus xi, if you forgot. Next, we brought this in two dimensions and learned what a vector was. After that, we learned what mass was and then about FEMA. We also saw how the force of gravity affects an object, and then how it affects them on ramps as well. Then we learned about friction, being a force that resists the motion of an object, and it's equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Then we saw how we can add friction to the objects in our game by making physics materials in Unity. After this, we talked about drag, and how the terminal velocity times b is equal to its mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Then we mentioned how the drag variable in Unity is equal to your b divided by m. After this, we talked about collisions, and how in perfectly inelastic collisions, objects stick together, and in elastic collisions, objects bounce off of each other with no energy lost. To determine the elasticity of a collision, you pick a number for the bounciness variable in the physics material. Next, we discussed how forces can be made instantaneous, with using an impulse to instantly change the momentum of the object. To do this, we use force mode.impulse in our last argument in the add force function. After this, we went on to rotational kinematics and saw how theta, omega, and alpha connect to x, v, and a. We also learned the angular kinematic equation. 
Then we discussed what torque was and how it's created by a force applied at a certain distance from an object's rotational axis, which was the tau equals fr sine theta equation. Then we learned about an object's inertia and how the torque will give an object an angular acceleration of the torque divided by the inertia. Finally, we talked a lot about the other rigid body component stuff. Man, we sure did learn a lot. Thank you so much for watching. I know this was a long one, but it kind of had to be this way. I strongly encourage you to save this video and revisit it if you ever forget how things work, and share it with a friend who's new to game development too. If this is your first time here, you should check out some of the other stuff I do too. I'm making a 3D puzzle game, which you can watch the videos on right here, and I also love doing game jams, which you can check out right here. I also try to respond to all the comments on my channel, so if you were confused on how something worked or had any other questions, put it in the comments, and I'll try my best to answer. Thanks again. See you soon.